Welcome back to Team O'Neill. I'm Wyatt. What we're going to talk about today are shock temperatures. Um, not really going to apply to everyone out there in a daily driving situation, uh, but if you're in a kind of performance driving scenario or you're driving at extreme temperatures, you know, really cold, or if it's particularly really hot for some reason, uh, there's a few things definitely to keep in mind. Um, and if you're a performance driver of any kind, you know, if you're out there and you want to get out on the track or you want to go, you know, adjust some suspension and things like that, temperature makes a big difference. It makes, you know, as much of a difference in shock performance as it does in, you know, brake pads. You know, brake pad temperature, engine oil temperature, all of this stuff. Uh, there's kind of a happy place where everything likes to be. And when it's outside of that, you've got some stuff to worry about. The real impetus for this video uh, was I was trying to figure out why on really cold mornings, you know, driving to work or whatever it is, you know, your car bottoms out, bang, you know, it really hard hits. Uh, and it's, you know, cold mornings up here in New Hampshire and I was trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, so I got a hold of the good folks at Coney. Uh, full disclosure, we've been doing a lot of work with those guys uh, for the rally school and stuff like that. We're running a lot of Coney shocks out here and that's, you know, uh, given us the opportunity to talk with some of their engineers and basically what's going on at very cold temperatures um, that oil inside the shock is just colder and thicker uh, and it's going to have a harder time passing through those you know the shock valves and those really little passageways in there um, that allow a shock to work so if you're not sure how uh, you know a shock works whether it's a normal kind of a shock or a strut or whatever it really doesn't matter um, and, you know, gas charge shocks are essentially the same, and we'll talk about that, how there's, a, you know, there is a small gas charge in here, but essentially it's really uh, the end of this rod has a little plate on it, basically, a disc that's inside here, and this is all full of oil. Uh, and that little disc essentially has small valves in it that it's going to restrict uh, when this shock tries to compress, uh, you know, that oil's flowing through the little valves at the bottom of this rod. So how quickly or slowly this shock opens and compressed is based entirely, almost entirely, on the valving. Um, you've heard shock valving and that's all it is. And this is the same uh, whether you're looking at a mountain bike or your dirt bike at home or a UTV or anything with shocks, it's essentially the same. Oil filled and the valving, uh, you know, more open allows this to travel more freely uh, and tighter allows it to travel more slowly, more dampened, more restrictive. So going back to my cold temp problems, um, you know, the engineers basically let me know that it's just the oil that's in here is too cold, it's too thick, it's become more viscous to pass through those valves fast enough. So essentially what's happening is that shock uh, is seizing up, you know, it's not allowing this rod to compress. Um, which historically goes back because I've always used, you know, often cheap shocks on my streetcar. I'm not running Coney Yellows on my streetcar. Um, I have in the past, uh, but for the most part, daily driver stuff, I run kind of cheapo replacement shocks, right? Uh, because I blow them out a lot and now I've kind of figured out why that is. And so that's sort of the impetus for this video again is to help you guys out because in the winter time, if the oil inside here is super cold, this goes to compress and can't, where does that shock go? Well, a couple of places. It can either go directly to the, uh, the top hat here, right? Your shock top mount, um, strut top mount, whatever you want to call. This guy right here takes a big old whack. Um, or uh, this shaft can bend, right? If this can't go down and in, that force has to go somewhere and it can actually kink the shaft, especially on, you know, a thinner shaft or a weaker, crappier material shaft or something like that. Um, and the third thing that can happen, uh, which is also something that I've personally seen a bunch up here in New England, even just on the street, if this shot can't go down, because that oil can't go through the valves, what's the path of least resistance for the oil? It's to come out through the seal. The shaft seal here um, is gonna blow out. You're gonna blow oil out um, of the seal that's in right here, and that's gonna squirt out, and all of a sudden, you know, myself, people I work with, friends that I've had over the years, we all blow up our suspension in the winter and didn't really know why, and now it's super obvious. It's because the oil that's inside here gets way too thick, it can't go anywhere, you're bending shocks, you're breaking shock top mounts, uh, you're wearing out other rubber components, you're hitting ball joints and tie rod ends and all that stuff in your suspension is taking that hit um, because the shock's not doing its job. Um, that is a lot more common with 
super cheap replacement, you know, shocks than it is with something higher performance. Uh, and we'll talk about, you know, the Coney stuff and then into the real, you know, racing suspension and stuff like that in a second here. But just know when you get a cheap replacement shock, all of the materials and components in this are just made more affordably. The steel is more affordable. You know, this whole system is more affordable, but specifically the oil that's inside here uh, is not the same oil that they're using in, you know, uh, performance street shocks or, you know, racing shocks and things like that. Just like a super cheap motor oil isn't as good as a performance street oil or, you know, a racing engine oil or a transmission fluid or what you put in your differentials or any fluids that you put in your car. It's exactly the same. Um, there's been kind of a disconnect over the years as companies keep marketing gas pressure shocks, gas shocks. You ever hear gas shocks? Uh, a lot of people, a surprising amount of people think that it's just, uh, you know, charged air in here or nitrogen or something like that. Um, and, you know, whether it's, monotube, dual tube, whatever we're talking about for suspension parts, uh, you know, it's that, you know, valves passing through the oil, this is oil filled, and that is what's creating the dampening. There's an additional gas charge in a lot of shocks, um, but primarily this shock functions on the compression of this shaft, has a plate at the bottom with the valves in it, that's traveling through oil, and that's what's creating the actual dampening. Some are higher pressure than that. Um, you know, there's inverted shocks, there's other things out there in the world, but it's really the passage of those valves through the oil that creates the dampening effect or most of it. You know, when you get into some more high performance scenarios, uh, you know, particularly something like this behind me, you see external reservoirs. Um, again, just so everybody's on the same page with what's going on here, this is full of oil. Um, this line to this reservoir is full of oil and the nitrogen charge is, you know, in this canister somewhat and there's a seal inside here. Um, so that's how that works. It's just uh, oil, oil, say halfway full of oil and the rest is a nitrogen charge. Um, and that also allows, and that's tunable so that that shock can rebound and uh, expand back to its original state, just like a mountain bike shock or something like that. So really, as far as daily driving, that's your only real worry with shock temperatures. Extreme cold temperatures go easy, let them warm up, run better shocks. Um, you know, it's often why we see, you know, stepping up again into the racing suspension uh, in the off-road world and kind of you see the, the overlander guys out there putting the desert racing suspension on your truck and then you drive it in the winter. Well, let's take a second and think about what is desert racing suspension? Well, desert racing suspension, just like rally racing suspension, is meant to take very high temperatures. You know, in the desert, uh, you know, King Hammers, Baja, that sort of thing, they're seeing shock temps three, four, 500 degrees. Uh, they're seeing critical failures of parts at the seals are melting. Um, and, you know, they've engineered desert racing suspension to withstand very high heat. All of those things make it not good at all in very cold temperatures. So if you've got a truck or an SUV and you're like, oh, I'm gonna put some you know, king suspension in this thing and rip around in the snow, it's not gonna happen the way you want it to and or you're gonna have to really make some adjustments. You know? And that's the nice thing about a good high performance, again, street suspension, the Coney Sports, Coney Yellows as we call them, uh, are very adjustable. And any real racing suspension is, again, going to be very adjustable. Hard to firm, compression rebound. Uh, we've got other videos on that kind of stuff, but just know that's where you're gonna be playing games with temperature. Um, because the colder it is, the thicker the oil is, the stiffer it's gonna be, uh, both in compression and rebound. The shock's gonna move more slowly. It'll be more dampened, more restrictive, if you think of it that way. And the hotter the shock gets, the hotter that oil inside is, the more easily it's gonna flow through the valves, the faster that shock's gonna move, right? On, in cold environments, you might adjust the suspension more soft so that you get the same result, right? You know, or if you tune your suspension at 70 degrees and you go out to somewhere where you're in Arizona, it's 110 degrees and you're on pavement, um, you might want to firm that up a little bit uh, because it's going to be behaving differently. So as far as extreme hot temperatures, uh, you know, it's not really going to be an issue uh, unless you know, this shock is opening and compressing very, very, very fast, uh, you know, over long periods of time. So really the only place you're seeing that is desert racing, rally cars, things like that. Again, talking to the Coney guys, they did a lot of the R&D and they'd make the shocks for the MRAP. Um, you know, and the MRAP is a, what, 16, 18 ton military vehicle. 
and it's only got one shock on each corner. Um, so when those guys were out in the desert testing, again, you know, an 18 ton military vehicle going out for a couple hours over, you know, bad desert terrain and coming back, they were having some failures and they've done some R&D because of that. But a big part of that's also airflow, right? Um, you've seen a lot of times when shock temps get really high, if you're on the track and your shock temps get really high, it's not because of the shocks. Um, Again, speaking with the engineers, one of the big things that they find is, you know, not venting the brakes properly, not venting this whole wheel well properly. You can overheat a shock. Sure, you can blow this shaft seal out. You can get this thing up to four or 500 degrees, but it's not because of the shock. The shock's not generating heat. Oftentimes the brake's generating the heat, or you've got the exhaust run somewhere really dumb or something like that. You need to vent this area out, get that air moving, uh, and that's what's gonna keep this shock at a working temperature. So basically, that's the moral of the story. For your normal daily driving situations, the only time you even have to think about shock temperatures are extreme low temps. Um, especially if you have cheap garbage shocks uh, and you wanna drive fast, you gotta let them warm up or you're gonna probably break them or break something else. Uh, if you've got a decent kind of all around street suspension, you know, something really good, uh, you, again, you're not gonna have to worry about that, um, but you will probably notice a, a performance difference as you go from cold temps to warm temps and that oil's changing a little bit and you might adjust for that accordingly. Um, moving up into the racing stuff, same page. Uh, you might even change, you know, the fluid that's in here. Talking to some motocross guys, you can change the shock oil in the shocks. Uh, you know, if it's cold out and those forks aren't even compressing, you can move to a lighter weight oil inside here that's gonna flow more freely. Uh, you know, if you're out in, again, the deserts of, you know, Mexico, you might wanna run a heavier oil. Uh, so that's all stuff, you know, getting into the racing stuff, this is all black magic and there's a thousand different kind of ideas out there and you can really go nuts with it. So hopefully that gives you at least a fundamental kind of basic understanding of shocks and temperatures and things like that and gets you thinking about it because that's all it is. Just like brake pad temperatures, tire temperatures, anything else, for most people it doesn't matter. Uh, but as you start to push it, you start doing some performance driving and things like that, you know, thinking about your shock temps, your oil temps, your trans temps, your, your brake pad temps, and your tire temps, it's all gets more and more important uh, as you start getting into racing. And so the sooner you think about it, uh, the better off you're gonna be out there in the world. So thank you so much for watching. If you're into these kinds of videos, check out the channel, consider subscribing. If you've got any questions about this or anything else, add it in the comment section. We get to those just as quick as we can. Um, check out teamoneal.com. We've got driving courses up here all year round. Uh, until then, have fun, be safe, and we'll catch you next time.